I'm a fellow from Brooklyn, New York. And a grateful American. As I stand here on the podium today, I would describe the, what I see, as my grandchildren would say, it's awesome. Dean Howard Frank, incoming Dean Anand, Anand Dallingham, distinguished guests, member of the faculty and staff, proud parents, and especially the graduates of the class of 2008, congratulations on reaching this momentous day and thank you for this great honor. In 1914, the British explorer, Ernest Shackelford, set out on, on an ambitious undertaking, the first ever transcontinental trek across Antarctica. To say the expedition didn't go as planned is the understatement of the century, and the trip became a tale of hardship and terror. Shackelford's ship, the HMS Endurance, became trapped in miles of Antarctic ice and the Endurance sank. There were no other human beings within a thousand miles. There was no radio to call for help. They had three months' worth of provisions and the worst Antarctic winter ever recorded was about to descend upon them. Shackelford and his 28 crewmen escaped into three lifeboats, and they made their way onto an ice floe where they camped for six months. Then Shackelford led them across 800 miles of open ocean to refuge on tiny, inhospitable Elephant Island. The wind chill hovered near 70 below zero. Shackelford and his few crew members took one of the lifeboats and headed back into the icy sea, aiming for the continent. When they reached the shore, Shackelford led his men on foot across miles of frozen tundra, a mountain range that had hitherto been considered impassable, and then scaled a glacier to reach a whaling station. It was 1,500 miles from the place where the endurance slipped beneath the water. He commandeered a ship and went back to Elephant Island for his men. It took Shacklefoot three times, fighting against seas, churning with ice, but eventually he was able to return and retrieve his crew. 22 months later, Shackelford brought home every single man who set out with him on the endurance. He didn't lose a single one. Shackelford failed to achieve his goal of crossing Antarctica on foot. The voyage was, in every way, a failure. But it is remembered as one of the greatest, most heroic failures in the history of exploration. And Shackelford is remembered as a great leader, perhaps one of the most inspiring and remarkable leaders the world has produced. Now, I don't expect that any of you will be trapped in Antarctica with a dead ship. And the responsibility for the lives of 28 men. But if you are ambitious, if you are a risk taker, you will encounter failure. And the higher you aim, the greater your potential for failure will be. Now, at a college commencement address, it's usual to have the speaker giving you, give you advice 
on how to succeed. But this afternoon, I'd like to go in a totally different direction and give you advice on how to fail successfully. Each of you is intelligent, talented, and accomplished. You already have a history of successes, culminating with the success that we are celebrating today. Your graduation from the University of Maryland and the Robert H. Smith School of Business, I'm sure that you've worked hard for your successes, and I'm confident that many successes still await you. So why would I bring the notion of failure to your attention on this day when we celebrate your success? I have two reasons that I'd like you to thoughtfully consider. First, consider this. It is fear of failure that leads to a failure of principles. Recently, we have seen many public institutions brought low by the misdeeds of their senior managers. Important and high-profile public institutions have fallen. Everyone from the media to the government has looked on in horror and dismay. As these ethical breakdowns have come to light, people have wondered why. What would cause a person at the height of their career, often enjoying unparalleled success, to risk everything through an unethical decision? Why would they even consider it? I believe that when people cheat, it's because they are afraid of falling short. When a student cheats on a test, it is because he's afraid of receiving a poor grade, afraid of disappointing his or her parents, afraid of the consequences that will result from not knowing the material. When a senior manager covers up corporate misconduct, it isn't merely greed that motivates him. It is the fear of being perceived as unsuccessful. Students who cheat on a test because they are afraid to fail grow up to be senior executives who lie about their corporation's quarterly earnings, all the while assuring analysts that they are doing just fine. Why? Because of fear. Fear of disappointing their stockholders. Fear of not making their quarterly earnings, of losing respect, or losing face in the marketplace. Fear of failure is the secret motivator behind many bad decisions. Here's a second thought for your consideration. Those who are afraid to fail are never able to reach their true potential. The person who is afraid to take risks and make mistakes will never achieve everything of which he or she is capable. That is because failure is the marker that tells us when we have reached our limits. One of the greatest mistakes you can make in life is to be continually afraid that you will make one. If you don't take risks, then you are shortchanging yourself because you'll never know how much more you are capable of achieving until you come to the place where you can't achieve anymore. Overcoming the fear of failure is vital for your future success. Fear will keep you from achieving the greatest measure of success for yourself and the organizations that you will one day lead. So let me start by assuring you that failure is not the end of this story. It is possible to fail in a way that leaves you smarter, stronger, 
and better positioned for future success as long as you take the opportunity to learn from your mistakes. Great innovators throughout history have understood that unsuccessful ventures are often a necessary step to success. Thomas Edison is famous for inventing products that change the way we live, including the light bulb, the phonograph, and the first motion picture camera. He created the first industrial research laboratory and founded General Electric. He held 1,093 U.S. patents. Edison was a one-man factory of ideas. But he had just as many bad ideas as good ideas. Behind each successful creation, Edison left a room littered with ideas. That just didn't work out. When asked what he thought about these disappointing efforts, Edison once said, I haven't failed. I just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Each setback taught Edison something he needed to know. Persevering through those 10,000 necessary failures was what allowed Edison to create so many successful products. Henry Ford, who changed the world by innovating manufacturing technology, also, also understood this principle. Ford said, failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. I had the opportunity to experience this for myself as an undergraduate here at the University of Maryland. Now, when I was 16 years old, I knew that I wanted to be in real estate as a builder. My grandfather had been a carpenter contractor. My father was a builder, even though he graduated college as an accountant. It seemed to me that studying engineering was the approach to give me the best tools to further my ambition. One of my courses as a freshman in the School of Engineering was mechanical drawing, which required neatness and the ability to visualize isometric drawings and spatial relationships. I didn't get it. In fact, my father arranged for an architect friend of his to tutor me to no avail, it was not registering. My professor understood my predicament and suggested that I take some aptitude tests. They confirmed that I probably would be, wouldn't be a very good engineer, but that I did have aptitude for finance, money and banking, accounting, and business. I really wanted to be the first engineer in our family, but it was not meant to be. I switched to business and accounting. My grades improved dramatically. It worked out pretty well, even though I failed to be an engineer. Now, that kind of experience was frustrating, but it pointed me in the direction of a career for which I was better suited, which made me happier and which has allowed me to contribute to my community in a way that would not have been possible if I was sitting at a drafting table all these years. That early unsuccessful attempt to be an engineer was an important marker in my life because it encouraged me to change course. Sometimes our setbacks are slight. Passing, slight passing things. That is certainly what we hope for when we fail. But the truth is that great failures are sometimes more valuable to us than small failures. Success isn't permanent and failure isn't fatal. The amazing side benefit of each setback you encounter is that it gives you an opportunity to learn 
but not in the usual incremental fashion. Now, failure gives you the opportunity to make a leap of learning. Careers are made when you come up against setbacks and you work to discover the better way of doing things. The measure of success is not whether you have a tough problem to deal with, but whether it's the same problem that you had last year. Great disappointments can lead to great successes. Christopher Columbus was a risk-taking entrepreneur. He started out not knowing where he was going. Upon arriving, didn't know where he was. And on returning, didn't know where he had been. And he did it all with borrowed money. Now that's a feat. But his great disappointment was also the source of a great unexpected success. Not just for Columbus personally, but also for all those who supported his enterprise. Christopher Columbus is remembered for, his great, for the great success of his greatest failure. Let me tell you about another disappointment of mine. Crystal City and Skyline Center are two of my company's mixed-use projects where we built 59 high-rise buildings. Crystal City was built primarily on leased land with very favorable terms for 99 years. Skyline Center was built on free and clear land contributed by the landowner for a 50% ownership interest. As a result of this financial engineering, we had tremendous flexibility in the carrying costs of this land over a long period of time in a business that is historically very, very cyclical. That worked to our advantages. Our companies were very successful for many years following our conservative land acquisition policy. During that time, we built up a large, talented organization. Now, I was anxious to start new projects that would allow growth and opportunity for the next 10 to 15 years for the benefit of all of our employees and the company. We acquired additional well-located land in Virginia, but it was only available with a substantial cash payment. At that time, the counties in Virginia were also requiring substantial cash contributions from developers in order to get rezoning allowing additional density. This should have been a warning signal to stop and rethink. However, our overall cash position was strong, our optimism high, and our goals to provide continuity for the organization were lofty, and the risks seemed manageable. However, the real estate cycle turned down, banks became overexposed, the Federal Reserve put enormous pressure on the banks where we had substantial personal liability, a very uncomfortable situation. These two projects were disappointments. We switched gears and decided to explore real estate investment trusts as a vehicle to raise equity, provide liquidity for estate planning, eliminate personal liability all through the public arena. This would also enable us to keep our organization intact. In June 1994, we went public successfully with our residential company, merged it in 2001, and sold the merged company in 2007 before the financial markets became illiquid. During December of 2001, we also merged our commercial company with a national commercial real estate investment trust and have lived happily ever after. Missions accomplished. This is what I learned. 
don't overextend land purchases that will require a decade to develop unless the financial terms provide a substantial cushion for flexibility, no matter how lofty your goals may seem. Now, I have benefited from my disappointments, and you can too. Don't let the fear of falling short keep you from reaching for the highest, most ambitious, and breathtaking goals. Now, the tragedy of life doesn't lie in not reaching your goal. The tragedy lies in having no goal to reach. It's important that you know how to fail, but I would be remiss if I didn't remind you of the things at which you should be careful never to fail out. Don't fail to always have a dream. It isn't a calamity to die with dreams unfulfilled, but it is a calamity not to dream. Michelangelo said, the greatest danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. Being defeated is often a temporary condition. Giving up is what makes it permanent. Because as Teddy Roosevelt said, it's hard to fail, but it's worse to have never tried to succeed. It's everyone's duty to be useful and fulfilled. It is your privilege as a human being to identify with causes beyond yourself, to contribute to your community and make a difference to the world around you. The world today is very, very different from the day I graduated from this school and it's changing almost too swiftly to comprehend. It is vital that you become involved, that you take an active part in shaping the world which you are going to inherit from my generation. I've taken the opportunity to be involved with this school because it is my dream that each student who graduates from it will be an ambitious dreamer, a courageous risk taker, and a principled ethical leader who will work to make this world a better place. Finally, don't be afraid to dream big. When you cease to dream, you cease to live. Don't be afraid to take risks. Take the big swing. Aim for the high mark. Accept that disappointments will be a part of the process that takes you to success the success to which each of you are capable and which I know each of you can achieve. I know you expect great things from yourself. Your parents expect great things from you. The Smith School expects great things from you. The University of Maryland expects great things from you. And I expect great things from you. It's a great honor and a privilege for me to have my name associated with yours. As you go out into the world to pursue your dreams, I wish you a future of both enlightening failures and resounding, long-lasting success. Thank you.
Howard, where are you? Before I surrender the podium back to Dean Frank, I'd just like to say a few words about this remarkable and visionary leader. From the first moment that we met, Howard Frank impressed me as a man who dreamed big dreams, a man who understood what it meant to take big risks and chance failure in order to achieve big results. His contribution to this business school has been enormous, and he is leaving us on a trajectory towards greatness. He will be missed and always remembered. Please join me in thanking Dean Howard Frank for his years of great service to the Smith School.